prepares us for the learning ahead. We're so grateful and honored that you've come to the National Constitution Center tonight. We're so grateful to C-SPAN for covering this important discussion about women's suffrage and Elizabeth Cady Stanton's central role in it. And C-SPAN friends, during these anxious times, as many people are uh, avoiding uh, leaving the home and large public gathering, it's so urgently important to engage in lifelong learning. And that's why watching C-SPAN is so important. And please also, and friends here as well, use the National Constitution Center's virtual online resources to learn about the Constitution. We have this spectacular new program called Classroom Exchanges that unite classrooms across the country for live discussions about the Constitution moderated by judges and master teachers. And classes around the country as you are looking for ways to continue your learning even from home or from uh, schools, go to the constitutioncenter.org, check out the interactive Constitution, pick a provision of the Constitution you don't know about, and let the learning continue. We're going to begin uh, tonight's discussion, uh, which is devoted to Lori Ginsburg's wonderful book, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, An American Life, by discussing the exciting new exhibit that the National Constitution Center is going to open on June 10th. It's called The 19th Amendment, Women Win the Vote. And it is about the history of the 19th Amendment and how women won the vote. And joining me to describe it and to discuss it is my wonderful colleague, Elena Popchak. She heads our exhibits department here at the National Constitution Center. And I just wanted to have a brief conversation with her about what she and her great team are trying to achieve in the exhibit and the story that they're trying to tell, uh, both to excite all of you about the exhibit and also to uh, set up the great discussion about Elizabeth Cady Stanton that will follow. So Elena, first of all, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, and thanks to you and your team for the amazing job you've done. At Seneca Falls in 1848, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and other great uh, advocates of women's uh, equality passed the Declaration of Sentiments, which said, among other things, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. They were using the Declaration of Independence as a model, but trying to extend it to include women's equality. What were the authors of the Declaration of Sentiments trying to achieve, and why did they gather in Seneca Falls to write it? So Elizabeth Cady Stanton uh, was the primary author of the Declaration of Sentiments, and it's amazing to look at the document itself. We will be featuring a copy in our uh, upcoming exhibit, um, but we, wanted to not only feature the artifact, but feature the inspiration that came from the Declaration of Independence. And um, you can read the different grievances that she wrote against uh, men instead of the king. Um, so we have featured those uh, in the exhibit. And just interesting in general in the time, the use of the Declaration of Independence um, in arguments for women's suffrage. Um, I've been calling a lot of quotes, going through a lot of speeches, congressional debates, and reading um, how women were fighting for the right to vote. And they are frequently going back to those founding ideals in the Declaration and saying no, no taxation without representation. Um, they're very central arguments. So they're saying, hey, wait a minute, we were kind of left out from that founding era, and we're going to rewrite that and say that all men and women are created equal. The relation between the Declaration and the Constitution is so central to the exhibit. You and your team did such a wonderful job telling the story in the exhibit about the Civil War and Reconstruction, of how the promise of the Declaration was extended to African Americans, and how Lincoln stood before Independence Hall in 1861 and pledged that he had never had an idea politically that didn't come from the Declaration. And yet, in this exhibit, you tell the story of the poignant fissure between African Americans and advocates for women's suffrage, who'd started off the uh, pre-Civil War era and the Civil War united. Frederick Douglass was a great advocate of women's suffrage. And yet, after the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the last of which extended the right to vote to African American men, but not to women, the movements split. Tell us about this, that split and what the consequences 
So it's a really significant story that uh, we do actually have started in our Civil War and Reconstruction exhibit that is permanent here at the Constitution Center. Um, and we continue that story into this 19th Amendment gallery where you can see the roots of these arguments um, and how there was unification after the Civil War towards a common cause. So before that, it really being slavery. Um, and then when slavery is abolished with the 13th Amendment, we get to the 14th Amendment and um, the very critical word male is inserted into the Constitution for the first time. And this upsets many um, white women in particular who were fighting for their suffrage. Um, and they ultimately end up starting to split over the 14th Amendment and then ultimately with the 15th Amendment, um, which as Jeff said, uh, guaranteed voting rights for African American men, that was that final break um, that there were women like Stanton and Anthony who were going to exclusively push for women's suffrage first, and that would exclusively be it. Um, they wouldn't allow um, African Americans to get the vote before them. And so you see a lot of the racism that started to uh, creep into the movement here and really become um, at the forefront of the debates um, and then really end up continuing through. And I'll, I'll definitely be interested to hear uh, what Lori uh, Ginsburg has to say on this topic because it's really central to the narrative is how to address the racism. And she as an historian and me as an exhibition developer have different ways of approaching that narrative and helping, uh, for me, it's helping our visitors understand the story and for her, um, through books and talks and lectures um, that she's able to show that narrative. So I definitely want to make sure we have that conversation about our different approaches and make sure to tell the truest narrative of this story. And it's so great that you've consulted Lori Ginsburg and other great historians of women's suffrage in crafting the script. And as you say, that insertion of the word male was so central. It showed that for the framers of the 14th Amendment, they didn't expect that the amendment would grant the right to vote because they said if southern states denied the right to vote, to any male citizen, then its apportionment in Congress would be correspondingly reduced. That made it harder for women's suffrage advocates to argue, as they did in the 1870s and 80s, that the 14th Amendment should be extended to women. And you tell the story of people like Victoria Woodhull, who argued before John Bingham, the man who framed the 14th Amendment, that it should include women. He rejected their claim, as did the Supreme Court in the Minor and Hypersack case. But then in a very big and important part of the exhibit, you tell the story of how the right to vote was won state by state in the 1870s and 80s. Describe that battle, uh, give us a sense of how it really began in the founding era where surprisingly there were a few states that granted women the right to vote, but it really picked up in the 1870s and 80s, why? So by that point, um, particularly in Western territories, uh, they wanted to encourage women to come to their borders. Um, so they started granting the right to vote. So it was a very practical reason um, to attract more people and then um, they'll be able to apply for statehood. So 1869 with Wyoming is the first. Uh, but there's a lot of great illustrations from the time that show progress sweeping from the west towards the east um, and you start having um, some people pushing for just a constitutional amendment, so it would be a 16th amendment, that would be the next in line after the 15th, and then you have a lot of women who are pushing at the state level for change, hoping that if enough states fall, then ultimately there will be national change. So this really propels the story into the 20th century, where we look at that continuation of different tactics, um, and then we get towards the end where there's those final few years where it gets really dramatic and you're, you're seeing a lot more of the photography that we're familiar with, with picketing um, in front of the White House, um, parades, processions, um, all these very public things happening. Um, and then ultimately with World War I, you have this push um, to ultimately grant women the right to vote and really fulfill a true democracy. And that leads to the final part of the exhibit where you tell that incredibly dramatic story of how President Wilson changes his position on the 19th Amendment and the states are ratifying it and it all comes down to a very dramatic story in Tennessee. So give us a sense of what happened. So the youngest state legislature in Tennessee, Harry T. Byrne, um, was planning on voting no on ratification. And this was the final state needed in order for it to become a part of the U.S. Constitution. Um, and he ends up receiving a letter from his mother um, who says, 
you really should vote yes on this ratification. So what does he do? He ends up switching his vote at the last minute. Nobody expected it. It pushes it over the edge and ultimately Tennessee ratifies. So it took one final vote to add it to the US Constitution. Amazing. Um, it shows how uh, close politics are and how, how one vote can make all the difference. As it happens at a great panel we did in uh, Grand Rapids on Monday about uh, the Electoral College, it turned out that Birch Bayh proposed an amendment that would have eliminated the Electoral College and had a popular vote for president and passed the House with overwhelming bipartisan support of Presidents Nixon, Ford, George H.W. Bush, and failed with just three or four votes in the Senate because of a filibuster. So uh, constitutional politics uh, can indeed turn on uh, one or two uh, decisions. Um, what are you most excited about displaying in this exhibit? There's so many great artifacts that you have. Uh, whet our appetites by giving a sense of some of the other things you're going to be dis displaying. Absolutely. So at the end of the exhibit, which we're leaving off, um, we are actually going to be featuring Pennsylvania's ratification copy of the 19th Amendment. Uh, so for those of you from uh, Pennsylvania, uh, it's kind of cool. Uh, we'll also be featuring an array of ephemera from the era of just women in various ways trying to uh, get the right to vote and convince other people that they should have that right. So there's a lot of cool imagery and sayings. Um, you'll see a lot of uh, posters, uh, different buttons with pants on them or rolling pins, a lot of, a lot of visual uh, cues there. Um, and then one of my personal favorites, I uh, will be featuring a ballot box uh, from the Reconstruction era when uh, some women were able to vote. Um, so this one, I believe, is from Utah. And because um, there's a county printed on it, so I've tried to track down where exactly that is. Um, but Utah allowed women to vote uh, early on. So it actually has printed on it women's ballots. So um, we, I went backwards through the exhibit, uh, but those are some of uh, the highlights. Well, that is wonderful. I'm so grateful to you and your team for doing such a superb job in creating this exhibit. I can't wait to uh, share it with all of you on June 10th. Please join me in thanking Elena Popchak. Thank you. And now, friends, we're so honored to hear from America's leading biographer of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, Lori Ginsburg. You'll be hearing all about Stanton and the, her remarkable life. And Lori Ginsburg will be interviewed by the head of constitutional content at the National Constitution Center, my great colleague, Lana Ulrich. Please join me in welcoming Lana Ulrich and Lori D. Ginsburg. continue the conversation with you um, about the exhibit and, and also in conversation with Lori. Um, Lori, thank you for being here to discuss Great. your book on Stanton. Um, thank you also for being a member of the National Constitution Center and thank you to all the members out there for your support and for coming to this program as well. Uh, your support makes it possible, so um, welcome. Um, Lori, so I just want to start by asking you um, a little bit about um, Stanton and her life. Um, before we do, I'll introduce you a little bit more too by telling a little bit about your background. You're a professor of history and women's studies at Pennsylvania State University, and you've written several books on women's history, um, including most recently, Untidy Origins, A Story of Women's Rights in Antebellum, New York. And obviously, your, um, the book that we're discussing tonight, Elizabeth Caddy Stanton, an American Life. Am I pronouncing it right, Katie or Ka Caddy? I think that the correct pronunciation is Caddy, but almost everyone says Katie, and I don't know why. Okay. <laughs> it's um, one of those don't know. Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, tell us a little bit about Stanton's life. She was born in upstate New York, I think in 1815, right. uh, about her family, and in particular, her relationship with her father, um, which I found really interesting um, detailed in your yeah. book. Okay, sure. First, thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to come to the Constitution Center always and to meet the people who make the extraordinary exhibits here, which I've always loved. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton is someone who I've always argued with. I've written a number of books in women's history and she's always in the room. She takes up a lot of space for those of us who do US women's history. And she's a fascinating character. She was charismatic, bossy, 
um, elitist, um, brilliant. And she's quite amazing. I really think that people who study US women's history can't help but grapple with her in some ways. I really do believe that for all of her flaws, there's no one quite like her in the 19th century. She was born in 1815 in Johnstown, New York. Her father was a judge. Her mother was a descendant of a revolutionary war hero. Um, they were quite conservative, um, wealthy, property owning, slave owning, which people often forget was still the case in upstate New York, in all of the, much of the North, in fact. Um, and very traditional, especially as, as Stanton remembered it on matters of gender. So the famous story that she told is that when she was 11, her last brother died, and she crawled into her father's lap seeking to give and receive comfort. And he put his arm around her inside and said, oh, my daughter, I wished you were a boy. <laughs> now, everybody groans at that. And the sting of the remark is certainly something that many women feel. But it's not actually an irrational comment for a father of a brilliant daughter who recognized that her life was going to be quite limited by the time and place in which she lived. I mean, there were really not very many options for a wealthy young woman born in 1815. Um, she got the best education available to girls at the Troy Female Seminary, but she was always resentful that she didn't get to go to college with the boys um, after handily beating them in all subjects in grade school. And she took that resentment with her in making a life that was devoted to challenging all the many ways, and you'll hear me say this many times tonight, not merely suffrage, all the many ways that she felt women's spirit was crushed, their opportunities limited, and their lives restricted simply by virtue of being girls. Um, it's interesting that her father, he was very much opposed to suffrage and was a traditionalist, and she kind of rebelled against that throughout her life. And um, you, you hint that they may have been part of her motivation, um, partly behind her, you know, yeah. some of the work that she did. But one thing that he did do was, um, you know, being conscious of the laws that regulated women, he put a lot of property in her name yeah. um, because he was maybe distrustful of, you know, husbands or the way they would treat um, their, their women or their wives' property. Um, so I thought that was kind of an interesting right. aspect. I mean, one, you know, in, in 1848, um, in April of 1848, the Married Women's Property Act passed in New York, which gave married women the right to own property, inherit property, sue, be sued, make contracts, and so on. And it was fathers like Judge Katie who supported this, partly because they wanted their inherited wealth not to go to sons-in-law. Um, not necessarily profligate ones, but just mm. unknown quantities. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton's husband, Henry Brewster Stanton, although he became a lawyer and was in the state senate for a while, he was not um, well off or a suitable beau when they met. And Elizabeth's father was clear that he was going to leave property separately for her, mm. including the house they owned. Yeah, her husband was an abolitionist. Um, he was later, he became a lawyer, I think, and a legislator. Yeah. Um, but he was primarily devoted to abolitionist work right. when they got married. And so for a conservative family to have their lively, brilliant 25-year-old daughter fall in love with this 35-year-old abolitionist lecturer <laughs> was not the choice. Mm -hmm. And the father first forbade the marriage, and then whatever, they ended up getting married and going on their honeymoon in 1840 to the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a very right. momentous event in her life, her first time out of the country. She uh, was right. interacting with all these British women who were very advanced and you know, the tactics that they were using in the, in the suffrage movement over in the UK. And that was a really um, powerful uh, experience for her. Yeah, I think what she was mostly impressed with was the American women she met there. She met Lucretia Mott and Sarah Pugh and Mary Grew, a bunch of Philadelphia anti female anti-slavery society um, women who were elected by their local chapters of the anti -slavery, American Anti-Slavery Society as delegates to London. But when they got to the World Convention, the British Quakers, who were much more conservative on matters of gender, much more mainstream in British life, they barred the women from participating and set them behind a bar, um, which outraged the young Elizabeth Cady Stanton no end, and um, outraged other people too, William Lloyd Garrison, Charles Remond, a couple of men sat behind the bar with them and refused to participate in a rare and bold action of solidarity um, with excluded groups. Mm -hmm. And it really, for Stanton, she described it as a political turning point in her life, meeting the older Lucretia Mott, meeting these women who had for years already, this is 1840, certainly for six or seven years, they'd already been struggling about issues around women's rights. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Elena, as you and Jeff were just talking about the exhibit, um, you know, what we've been talking about is actually pre-Seneca Falls um, and just as important to the movement, but obviously the exhibit, the main focus kind of drops you in at 1848 at the Seneca Falls um, Convention. And so, um, you know, what, what's the approach um, to telling the story of, you know, Stanton, um, her work prior to Seneca Falls and kind of incorporating the work of the anti-slavery movement and the importance of that to the suffrage movement? Yeah. yeah, it's always interesting when you go to start working on an exhibit, you have a very limited space. There's never an infinite amount of space. So you have to make important decisions at the get-go. Where are we going to start in time? Where are we going to end in time? It's not always clear cut. Um, but we did decide as a jumping off point to go with 1848 with Seneca Falls, but that doesn't mean we don't acknowledge what's happening before. So through historical events occurring before that, what was voting like at the founding is really important. Um, we include the story of New Jersey. Uh, their first state constitution uh, did allow some women to vote, particularly if they held property, um, so primarily widows, um, but it's it's that early point to understand where are we in time? What do I need to know for when we get to 1848, what life was like for women? So we certainly tread that ground from the original constitution being written and then um, through 1848, but we really jump off at 1848. Um, but we, we tell the story of Stanton. We feature a lot of other uh, women and men who were fighting for women's suffrage. So you'll be able to meet some of these women and men um, in an interactive element in the exhibit um, where we'll feature bios for each of these individuals. So Stanton is one of them. So you'll get a little bit of her background as well as her influential uh, role. But it's interesting for writing exhibits. There's only so much you can include. So if you envision for any one person, there might be about 50 words, which is about three sentences. So um, it could be a Herculean task just to get it down to that really important nugget of information. So it's always interesting to think of how, um, like, Lori is able to write a whole book on one person, and I have maybe two or three spots in the exhibit if we're talking about the Declaration of Sentiments or we're talking about Stanton um, in particular. What I would say is that historians, although we write, this book is about one person, I've written books about large groups of people, but historians, although we write one book, we're always in conversation with one another. And I think it's important to note that historians disagree with one another. We're sort of sitting at a very large table. There are archivists and curators and museum folks at the table, too, doing somewhat different kinds of work. And we are always in conversation with each other about some of the same questions about where do we start and end a story, but also what's the framework for that story and what's the interpretation in the story. And I guess the, the main difference to me is not so much between what we do is not so much um, the, the temporal focus or the topical focus as the different ways that we interpret stuff. Mm -hmm. um, for me, there is no women's suffrage movement in 1840. There's not really a suffrage movement till after the Civil War. All of these folks are abolitionists. Every one of the 300 people who went to the Seneca Falls Convention had heard of women's rights before because they were all involved in the anti-slavery movement in one way or another. And so to me, it's not just that anti-slavery provides a jumping off point or a context for women's suffrage and women's rights, although it certainly does that. It's that it was the audience and the constituency and the, what Stanton and Anthony referred to as the school of abolitionism that launched their thinking and their careers um, in different ways for different activists, of course. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to keep in mind that, and it's very hard to do this, um, it's very hard to understand how radical all this was. Um, I have some tricks that I do with students about this, but it's hard to understand it when, when the Seneca Falls Convention demanded a numerous, as you pointed out about the Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments, a range of rights for women, the vote among them, and when people demanded an end of slavery, these seem so obvious to us that we can't imagine how outrageous they were at the time, but it's important to keep in mind that these people were the lunatic fringe of their generation. They were the people people did not want to be seen with on the street. And it's hard for us to do that. 
to remember that. Well, with Seneca Falls, I mean, um, as you write in the book, Lori, uh, the, there was a large consensus, it seemed, around most of the points mm -hmm. that the women were trying to make, the one exception obviously being the right to vote. And to the, to the extent that other women suffragists said to Stanton, you know, you can't put this in there. People are going to think we're crazy. They're not going to take us seriously. Even her husband, I think, said that. It's, it's going to make it seem like a farce. But she insisted, and it got in there. Right. Can I explain that sure. context a little yeah. bit? People have often, people, including Elizabeth Cady Stanton, have often thought that the folks who objected to including the vote did so because they were timid or politically cautious. But I think that's not the case. People like Lucretia Mott, who were Quakers, did not believe in working in electoral politics. They were non-voting abolitionists. The men, too. They believed that politics were, hard for us to believe, dirty and corrupt <laughs> and based in violence and they chose not to work in that world of electoral politics. So when someone like Lucretia Mott said, it's with great, as she did a couple years later, it's with great reluctance that I demand the vote for, woman, for women, even as she was demanding it, she, that reluctance stemmed not because she was more timid or conservative, but because the vote was a fraught tool for um, what were called at the time ultraists, you know, moral suasion abolitionists and reformers who didn't believe that voting was the best or most appropriate way to create moral change in a society. So I think Stanton, who thought she was the most radical person on the planet, um, and always right, um, exaggerated other people's timidity about this. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, um, so was, was Lucy Stone similar to Lucretia Mott? In that, because I know she founded the American Women's Suffrage Association, which had a different approach to the one that Stanton and Anthony would go on to found, the National Women's Suffrage Association. But that's already decades later. Lu right. Lucy Stone was speaking as an anti-slavery agent and adding to her speeches lectures on women's rights before mm -hmm. Stanton thought to get up on a podium mm -hmm. a couple years earlier. So Lucy Stone already saw a connection between demanding the end of slavery and demanding the end of restrictions on women's um, legal, political, and, you know, what do we want to say, cultural lives. Um, this is 20 years later, mm -hmm. after the Civil War, and the split occurred for a variety of reasons. You mentioned um, you know, kind of abolitionists versus women's rights activists after the Civil War, but it's important to remember that many white women's rights activists sided with those who thought that black men should get the vote first. And some of, and Stanton did not. And some of this, oh, it's such a complicated and interesting debate, um, but I think they both took ethical positions based on a different way of seeing the world. For Stanton, I think I actually brought this quote with me. For Stanton, the 13th Amendment ended the question of um, slavery. She, has, she at one point said, um, I wrote this down because I just think it's a wonderful quote. But I'm not. Oh, she said, in 1868, she said, the curtain has fallen on the last act. This is regarding the Negro question. The curtain has fallen on the last act. The lights are extinguished and the audience gone to their homes. This is in the face of enormous, vicious, racist violence in the South, which we know she read about, because it's in the newspaper she read. And for her, anti-slavery stood more or less as prelude to what she viewed as the more important rights of women like herself. Um, other women didn't agree with her. Lucy Stone didn't agree. Mm. And other women, African-American women as well as white women, thought that it was more urgent in that crisis for black men to have the vote so that their communities would be represented in Southern legislatures. So it's not really a, it's not, I, I would resist calling it a sort of black men versus white women um, split. There were many different kinds of splits which had to do with making different decisions about what was the greatest emergency in the face of re early reconstruction. Yeah. Well, I know, Elaine, this is one of the biggest questions um, and challenges in kind of teaching about this era. Um, and you were very interested in, in sort of hearing Laurie's thoughts on it about how, you know, to approach it um, in, in a fair but accurate way, um, presenting that history to a modern audience. I yeah. think that Stanton <laughs> really thought she was taking the moral high ground. She said she believed in universal suffrage. Now, you all understand when people say universal suffrage, they don't mean to include children, <laughs> which is it, you, but you, and you laugh, but logically, children are citizens as well, and this is how unthinkable women's suffrage was to a lot of people. It was similar to calling for votes for children, uh, or analogous uh, to calling for that. Um, Stanton could have stuck to the moral high ground of saying no one's rights should precede anyone else's, but instead of doing that, she resorted to some rather extraordinarily ugly racist remarks 
that still make us, um, that are still painful to read. And she made them publicly, and she alienated her friends, including the ever loyal Frederick Douglass, who I would never say anyone in history was a saint, but he put up with a lot of grief from her. And, you know, she didn't stick to the, to the moral high ground that she could have. She was a political absolutist. Absolutists can be thrilling, but they also can be sometimes wrong. <laughs> My view. And historians disagree about this. That's interesting, too, though, because I think you, you described that um, she was very cautious about sort of writing about anything that she felt uh, in her, oh, yeah. she wrote a lot, but she didn't write about, oh, ha this is how I feel about this subject or that subject. She wanted to have the exterior of a saint because she was very aware that she was the portrayal of the suffrage movement, and yet, you know, then there's all these other complications about the things that she was writing with regard to race and nativism and things like that. She didn't think that that took away from her saintly uh, image. She thought she was right. Oh, interesting. That, that is not the part she worried yeah. about. You know, I think she had, like everybody, I think she had issues with her children. I mean, for such an advocate of progressive womanhood and divorce and women's autonomy and so on, she had seven children. Mm -hmm. I mean, virtually no other suffrage or activist leaders had that many children. She had a lot mm -hmm. of children. Mm -hmm. And um, at one point she referred to her, I think, seventh baby as her biennial clumsiness, <laughs> implying that she ha had some idea how not to have so many children, but did anyway. And, you know, I think she had, like everybody, I think she had family difficulties. You know, some of the children sided with her, some of the children sided with her husband, some of the children were just the, were the caretakers, you know. It's a complicated family, and she destroyed a bunch of papers that would have given us more insight into those. Right, yeah, with her relationship with um, Susan B. Anthony, who had you know, her own uh, obligations, but she didn't have any children. And you write, I think, about an instance where Anthony was observing Stanton and all of the children that she had around her and just kind of wondering, how are you able to do all of this work? And you, know, you have children and a household, and how, how can you take care of it? And I think it's a, you know, it's a challenge that women today still struggle with. Well, the way she took care of it was she had a housekeeper named Amelia Willard, a Quaker woman who stayed with her for 35 years or something. And, and um, Anthony would show up and help. And um, it was probably chaotic. I think you know, there were times when Stanton couldn't be on the road, so she would be home and she'd be writing, which is what she loved anyway, and writing speeches and thinking. Um, Stanton, you know, we describe her as a founder of a women's suffrage movement, but she described herself as a leader of thought not institutions. And she was much happier staying home and writing speeches than going to conventions, which she thought were boring. And often when we read um, accounts of conventions, it'll say, you know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton gave this speech. Well, really, she didn't. Really, she wrote it, and Anthony read it for her. Because she didn't like to, she didn't like it. Right, I think you mentioned that it was, it was almost immediately after she founded the National Women's Suffrage Association, they had their first convention, and she didn't want to go. <laughs> she yeah. said, I to stay home. You know, she just loved what she called throwing my thunder. She loved it. She loved riling up her friends. She has this great quote, which I hope to be able to use one day um, on her 75th birthday. I'm planning this when I, for the distant future. Um, on her 75th birthday, she said, my feeling is to tone up rather than tone down, <laughs> which is, you know, a, a great <laughs> motto. And I have to think that her friend, Susan B. Anthony, never worried much about her toning down. I think. Mm her friend would have preferred her to focus. Because Anthony did believe that women's suffrage was the primary and most important goal, and everybody needed to focus. Mm -hmm. And Stanton didn't. She was always on to the next great cause of women's oppression. One thing that Stan both Stanton and Anthony did was, um, you know, in the midst of the various strategies and pursuing the 19th Amendment, the federal amendment, the state by state, um, uh, reform that they actually went to the polls and tried to vote. You mentioned mm -hmm. November 2nd, 1880, election day is when Stanton yeah. tried to vote and, and Anthony, excuse me, Anthony did as well. I know Elena, we're talking about that in the exhibit too. Um, so maybe describe a little bit, you know, what, what, what was their thinking behind just going to the polls and trying to vote? Well, I think Jeff mentioned this earlier. There was this practice called the new departure, which Victoria Woodhull and others, you have it in the exhibit, Victoria Woodhull, Woodhull sorry, and others came up with, which was that the 14th Amendment granted women citizenship, and therefore they were entitled to vote, and they should just do it. And it started actually early um, with a number of women, white and African American women in Washington, D.C., who went off to try to vote. And there were dozens of women all over the country. Vineland, New Jersey was a big place for voting. And there were women all over the country who decided to go try it. 
And in 1872, Susan B. Anthony in Rochester, with her sister and a bunch of friends, went and voted, got arrested, became a big cause celeb. The judge, for reasons that absolutely escaped me, asked her if she had any final words to say at the end of her trial, <laughs> which strikes me, has always struck me, as such a foolish thing, because of course she gave a speech, and of course she published it and distributed it throughout the country, and it became a big cause. She refused to pay the $100 fine, um, and it became a big deal. By the time, and also, Anthony, because she was now voting, took the process very seriously. Voting is never merely symbolic. We all know this. Um, she went and voted, the, as she put it, the straight Republican ticket, deciding that the two candidates were awful enough, but one was slightly better than the other. So she voted for Grant over Greeley. And you know, it was, it was hard. Um, Stanton, in, in, I think, 1880, when she decided to vote, it was all, the new departure had already pretty much failed. It was a symbolic act for her, on her part. Um, there's a very funny story where the person who takes your ballot from you thought this was going to be really historic, so he wanted to buy her ticket. And he ended up, she kept it because it's in her papers. He signed his name to it, and it's very cool. Um, she made a big deal about it, but it didn't ever become the cause that Anthony's did. Mm -hmm. And by then, she was launched onto other causes anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I think you mentioned, Elena, is the ballot box that we have, is that mm -hmm. from the New Departure era, or um, what does that one represent? It is, yes. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Thinking that it is from Utah, a place where they had granted women the right to vote, we think it was not meant for women who couldn't vote and were trying to. Um, so we pair that uh, with the story of the women who were trying to vote under this new departure strategy. And when I was doing the research for this exhibit um, and learning about the new departure, it was just such a constitutional story because they're really mm -hmm. using the 14th Am Amendment primarily saying, well, we are citizens, therefore, we have the right to vote. So they're, that new amendment's ratified, they're going to the polls, and um, having a range of experiences. So when we think in exhibits of how to convey information uh, to different types of learners, because everyone in here has a different way that they prefer to learn. Um, and you may come to a museum and be drawn towards reading every single thing that I've written for an exhibit. Great if you do that. Or you might prefer the artifacts or just bop around and, and take a different part. So this particular story, uh, we decided to tell through a physical interactive. So we're, there's gonna be a display of ballot boxes that you're going to be able to lift ballots out and see what was happening in different states and learn about uh, different women's stories who were trying to vote. So one of them featured is Carrie Burnham, great Philadelphia story. Um, she went to the polls in uh, 1871. She tried to vote here and she failed to do so. And then she took her case all the way to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and they said, you know, yes, you're a citizen, but that does not mean you get to vote. So um, that ultimately was uh, an early ruling that would lead to the Supreme Court ruling in Minor v. Happersett a couple years later, 1875, saying the same thing. So that was kind of at the end of the new departure point um, when the Supreme Court ruled on it. But um, we wanted to have an opportunity for people to engage with these different stories and connect with people who maybe they're from your hometown or they're from a state that you come from, that you can learn about what they were trying to do during this important era. And was Stanton, um, Lori, the brains behind the new departure? I mean, you, you write that she, but you write that she had such a great intellect and she was very influenced by her father who was a judge and the lawyers that were around her. I mean, what was her role in kind of helping develop the legal strategy? No? I don't, I, don't, I mean, she, she realized right away that this was a great strategy. She recognized it, but she was not an originator of it. No. No. She was an early supporter of Victoria Woodhull, who in 1872 ran for president. Mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> so she was, right there to um, support the first woman to run for president. Mm -hmm. And Anthony was very unhappy about this and said, whatever you do, do not put my name on any list for Victoria Woodhull's presidency. And Stanton responded by doing exactly that. <laughs> so, you know, she, she was quite an independent thinker, but not always 
um, a self-aware one. Well, you do write though that Stanton, um, you know, had this conviction though that you know she, as an American citizen, you know, right. with, with, with respect to what Elena was saying about voting being a right of citizenship, as an American mm -hmm. citizen, she was entitled to vote based on that. That was that was right. a conviction that she had. I think actually that that's a lot of what gets at the source of Stanton's what came out to be this really ugly racism um, in her in the debate over the Fifteenth Amendment. I think that Stanton had this bone deep conviction that as the daughter of American revolutionaries and as a white Protestant middle class woman, she was as American, which of course she was, as the men of her class and background, and that the only disability that she experienced, since she of course thought she was smarter than all of them anyway, that the only disability she experienced was the disability of sex. And it was on the basis of this profound sense of entitlement and belonging that I think she thought that she should have all the rights, not only the vote, you know, the right to an education, the right to enter occupations, the right to property, the right to vote, all these things that became very much part of what we take for granted um, and that middle class women for the most part did gain throughout the course of the 19th century. I think her conviction that she was very much a member of the um, elite of, the, of the, the founders of the nation was very important to her. There's a part even in the Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments when she expresses outrage. I, I, the quote is um, that women were denied rights that the most ignorant and degraded men, both natives and foreigners, had. That's as early as 1848. That's not um, in the battle over the 15th Amendment. She just had this sense very early on that she was more deserving, for lack of a better word, than people who were given more rights than she was. Mm. You know, better, you know, I'm as good as the boys kind, kind, of, kind of attitude. Really felt that very deeply. Right, I think that plays into um, some things that she was writing later on, which I think Anthony also um, disagreed with and was trying to get her to not write with about this concept of educated suffrage. Yeah. It's really her daughter Harriet who was very upset about this. Mm -hmm. So later in her life, Stanton joined on with people who thought maybe we can get women's suffrage passed if we just grant it to educated women, but also it involved limiting the vote to educated men as well. And this was at a time after 1880 when more and more immigrants were coming into the United States, many of them not English speakers, many of them not Protestants, right? If you think back to the, to the great surge of immigration between 1880 and 1920, there are lots of um, Southern Italians, most of them Catholic, there were Jews from Eastern and Central Europe, and Stanton pretty, easily joined with the forces that would limit suffrage to those who had an education and who were literate in English. Her daughter Harriet, who had um, moved to England and married there, Harriet Stanton Blatch, was outraged by this. She just viewed this as her mother's great failing that her elitism had taken hold of her in this way and that she would succumb to that kind of anti-foreign um, I don't know, snobbery, mm -hmm, elitism. Mm -hmm. So they did have, they did conflict about that. I don't know what Anthony thought about it so much. Yeah. Um, we, do we cover um, her relationship with her daughter, uh, Elena, in the exhibit, Stanton and, and Harriet? Yeah, we have two moments. Um, I alluded to the one earlier of yet to meet the suffragist. Uh, so there are basically three generations of suffragists uh, through this era because it's about a 70 year period. So we have two moments in the exhibit uh, that you'll get to meet these people. And uh, we highlight Harriet at the beginning with the photo of her with her baby daughter, Harriet, who then we know later becomes a suffragist. So she pops up again later as an adult and working for the same causes that her mother was working for. And um, we try to do the same with um, other connections like Lucy Stone and her daughter as well. So um, there's a really cool thread. And especially here in Philadelphia, there's some interesting, um, like the Fortin family is very prominent, um, the Grimkes, that they continue they are, that very, um, the abolitionist roots really go through the suffrage movement as well. So as Stanton, um, you know, toward the end of her life, Lori, you're right about how, um, you know, she didn't travel as much, although she was quite famous at the time. And so what, you know, she, I mean, she unfortunately dies in 1902, which is still 18 years before the 19th Amendment is ratified. What was she doing at the, you know, toward the end of her life um, to, you know, continue to um, help the cause of suffrage? Okay. I mean, I, I agree that she, that it's unfortunate that she, that she and Anthony didn't live to see the ratification of the 19th Amendment, but she was 87 when she died. She, mm -hmm. you know, there's this whole thing about how she died so soon. But 87, especially at that time, was not so soon. Um, um, 
by the end of her life, she, Stanton really got bored. Intellectually, I mean, really got bored. And she, in the 1880s, she and Anthony sat down to write the history of women's suffrage to gather all of the sources that they could find about their movement, in part to gather the sources which were going to disappear, but also in part to establish their role as the leaders of the movement and honestly to shape the movement in a very particular kind of way, originating in New York, them as the leaders, um, and a bunch of different things. Um, if anyone's interested in more reading on this, Lisa Tetro has written a wonderful book on this subject. Um, and then she decided she wanted to rewrite the Bible. <laughs> because Stanton was an ardent secularist, the word didn't exist, but she was an ardent secularist, very skeptical, deeply Protestant in many ways in terms of her thinking, but very skeptical of organized religion. She felt that the ministers in her era had crushed women's spirit and limited and opposed their efforts to change their roles, which there was some basis to. Um, so she tried to gather women from around the world to write what we would call feminist biblical criticism, except that it didn't exist yet, so there wasn't a word for it. Um, her friends were very annoyed at her about this. Anthony, Martha Coffin Wright, all of them were like, really, you're gonna spend your time on this when there's so much more work to be done? And she was just adamant that this was an important late in life work for her. And so she wrote this book called The Woman's Bible. I mean, edited it, really. Um, and was chastised, censured, censured by her own organization and movement for it. Because by the 1890s, the movement was needing and getting the support of more conservative ministers, as well as the support of women like the Women's Christian Temperance Union, who believed that women's suffrage would gain you know, a purified home, an end of alcohol, and so on, the things that they, um, want, that they were struggling for. And so they were not so interested in alienating the clergy as Mrs. Stanton was by that time. And so she continued to be as unrespectable and annoying as she could <laughs> within, even within her own movement. And did she focus um, throughout, or maybe even at the end of her life, about um, the, sat the laws of coverture at the time? Or what was the status toward the end? Had, you know, had, had most of them been repealed? Yeah, the Married yeah. Women's Property Act yeah. were in place? They were, yeah. yeah. There's, there's very little, there's still unequal laws. I mean, it's not until the 1930s that if you were an American woman, like Stanton's daughter Harriet, and you married a foreigner, you lost your citizenship. Which, when women's suffrage passed, some American women discovered to their, you can imagine, annoyance. Um, so there were certainly, into all of our lifetimes, there were certainly laws that were um, discriminatory against women, but the laws of property ownership had changed. And even by the 1860s, many of the laws of wage ownership had changed. There's still complicated laws about who owns unwaged housework and domestic labor, but that remains unresolved. Mm -hmm. I think the issue, I think you write about how the issue of divorce was another controversial yep. one that she wanted to fight for, but I think it created tension with um, you know, religious uh, suffragists who didn't necessarily want to fight right. that fight. Right, including her friend, Lucy Stone's sister-in-law, Antoinette Brown Blackwell, who was a minister by training and just you know, did, not, did not want to touch this idea that the sacred compact of marriage was, I don't know, it nearly, nearly or primarily a legal contract that could be broken. But these women were also, for the most part, temperance advocates. And the argument was women should be able to divorce drunken husbands. And there was an ongoing debate about what was worth bringing up in the context of women's conventions. Stanton was ready to bring up anything. You know, Stanton was prepared to th hurl her thunder. And not everyone wanted to do that. She was not strategic. I think it's fair to say she was not strategic. Well, we have a great number of audience questions. Um, before I get into them, I'll, I'll just ask Elena, is there anything that you want to ask Lori um, you know, from your perspective as an exhibit developer that she can help um, guide us on in terms of the exhibit? Yeah, so for obvious reasons, we've been focusing on a, period, a particular period of time, Stanton's life. Um, but there's plenty that comes after yeah. 1902 and plenty that comes after 1920. So um, as I mentioned, how we grapple with how to end an exhibit, I'm really curious uh, what you'd most want to convey to people about what the 19th Amendment did or did not do. That's a great question and a really complicated one, um, which historians are still grappling with a lot. The point that I would make about that and the main thing I would convey, which people often don't know, is that before the passage of the 19th Amendment, millions of women already voted. 15 states had full women's suffrage, another dozen states had presidential suffrage, which I have never understood why you would let people vote for president and nothing else. But um, 
and other states had partial suffrage or, or they could vote in primaries. So millions of women could vote before the 19th Amendment. And now I fully understand that in the context of a museum devoted to the national constitution, it makes sense to focus on the constitutional amendment. But it is important to point out that millions of women could vote prior to it, but also many, many women couldn't vote after it. And it's equally important to point that out, that African American women in the South, Native, many Native American women, many Chinese women who were not allowed to become citizens, um, many women in territories, I recently learned that, that women in Puerto Rico didn't get the vote, only illiterate women got the vote nine years later under pressure from the US Congress when the Puerto Rican legislature gave them the vote. So, so the 19th Amend Amendment is a really interesting moment and act to commemorate, but historians are gonna complicate any kind of celebration of it as accomplishing much. What it may have accomplished a great deal is activating African American women in the South to try to register to vote. And Southerner, white Southerners recognized, um, Liette Gidlow is a historian who's been writing about this, white Southerners recognized that it was gonna take a lot of work to disenfranchise twice the number of people they'd previously been disenfranchising. And I really don't mean that you know, sarcastically. I, I mean, it took work to set in place the machinery of disfranchisement, and now more people we're going to be disfranchised to maintain white supremacy and Jim Crow. And that is another facet of who couldn't vote. Mm -hmm. I think at the exhibit we do touch on, you know, after the 19th Amendment, what were the other advancements in voting rights, including additional constitutional amendments that were passed later that expanded the right to vote as well? Yeah, I'm um, sure I hope to carry through that narrative. So there's an understanding that, well, at that moment, for the people who could vote, what were they going for? And um, some pursuing the ERA. Um, others pursuing legislation for um, labor laws, um, minimum wages, that kind of stuff. And then is all the other people who couldn't vote, what was their struggle like? What, how did they continue to fight for that right and how did that play out? And it's important to note that, w that African American women in particular who went to the white dominated, the mainstream suffrage organizations, Alice Pauls and so on, asking for help in expanding black suffrage were basically told it's over and they were not given any assistance in doing that. Well, I wanna to get to some audience questions before we have to wrap up. Um, first question asks, what was it about upstate New York that allowed this quote unquote lunatic fringe to develop? <laughs> um, upstate New York, central New York really, along the Erie Canal has been known for a long time as the burned over district and it was a place of revivals. Charles Finney had revivals, other ministers had revivals through the 1820s and 30s, and it was famous for, um, there were Quakers there, but mostly um, radical Protestants of various stripes who were very active in anti-slavery and temperance. It's the origin of the Mormons were up there, the millenarianists, the, you know, Millerites, I guess, millennialists, Millerites, all kinds of cults and sects and groups emerged. Some became more or less mainstream social justice movements. Some became extremely right-wing, um, what, um, sects. Others became utopian communities. There was just a lot going on up there through the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. And that helped to spurn some of the uh, feminist uh, suffragists, you think, yeah. to, the, to the work that they did? Yeah, I think it did. I mean, I, a number of years ago, I wrote a book called Untidy Origins that I think you mentioned, which is about Six women in Jefferson County to New York, which is way up there on the Canadian border. Um, six women in Jefferson County, New York, who in 1846, two years before Seneca Falls, petitioned their state constitutional convention for full political and civil rights for women. And these were six virtually unknown farm women. They didn't then go to the Seneca Falls Convention. They disappeared from history. Um, so there was stirring up there, there was talk. I think it was not outrageous in their communities. Mm, that's interesting, and, and, and in the West as well, that's where um, many territories granted women the right to vote. I think, Elaine, you mentioned the state interactive that we'll have. Um, that may have also been a practical uh, reason yeah. to encourage women I, to move there, uh, but it's just interesting how the right to vote kind of moved across the country over time. Mm -hmm. Great, um, so uh, Laura, you mentioned the Women's Christian Temperance Union. This question asks, how did the passage of the 19th Amendment influence or spur the passage of the 21st Amendment, or was there crossover um, from suffrage to temperance? Temperance is the 18th Amendment. Prohibition is the, 18th, is the 18th Amendment and right, came before right, right. the 19th, the, the Women's Suffrage Amendment. 
And I think that it probably had a lot to do with um, small town Protestant women who already could vote in many of their towns and states. And they had a lot to do with passing the 18th Amendment mm -hmm. in the couple of years prior. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting that a lot of the anti-suffrage arguments, which they're yeah. very active at this point, um, formally organizing around like the 1890s, uh, but really a lot of them coming from the liquor industry right. and very practical. Right. If women get the vote, they're likely going to vote for temperance, for right. prohibition. Right. Right. It, is, it is important, actually, to remember that there were, it's great that you reminded me of that, that there were powerful forces organized against women's suffrage. It wasn't just, oh, you know, women are too delicate to vote. That argument had long been solved. Women were in all kinds of areas of public life, and I think, I don't know who still believed that by the 1890s or whenever, or through the next 30 years. But there were powerful forces against women voting, including by women, who, you know, very conservative women who believed that this was going to bring out other radical behaviors. I actually have a great, um, a, actually have a great quote on this. There's a magazine called The Woman Patriot, which came out, um, which was devoted to not passing women's suffrage and not allowing socialism and all this stuff. Um, and at one point they said, no, after women's suffrage had passed and was ratified and in the Constitution, they have all these lawsuits to undermine it. And they wrote, um, first of all, let us remember that women's suffrage is tied to, as they put it, the other twin, the damnable 15th Amendment, which was forced upon the then helpless South. So this is many decades after black men have been, three decades after black men have been disenfranchised in the South, they're still bent out of shape about the 15th Amendment because they recognize that radical Causes go together. N n suffrage was never isolated. But then they went on to say, this is the woman patriot in 1920, nobody but the mentally blind ever expected the feminist movement to stop at the winning of the vote. And then they go on to quote from a magazine called The Birth Control Review, which was edited by Margaret Sanger. So, you know, this idea that, that the demand for women's rights is the top of a slippery slope is actually true. You know, you actually don't know what you're stepping off onto when you make this outrageous demand. It actually was true. Well, I think that leads into um, another question, um, which asks, when women first got the right to vote, what impact did they have on, um, I guess, any sort of election outcomes? And um, I don't know if you know what age, uh, were there age limits set at the time? 21, yeah. They had less of an impact than they said they would. Mm -hmm. um, and women, it turns out, didn't all vote the same. Mm -hmm. um, they passed a couple of the Shepherd Towner Act, a couple of acts that uh, were sort of um, progressive era, you know, government helping clean up milk and things that we all take very much for granted. But they, you know, I read one historian recently who said the passage of women's suffrage, the passage of the 19th Amendment was a bit of a thud because it didn't, a bit of a, it landed with a bit of a thud, this historian wrote, because it didn't actually lead to the kinds of dramatic changes that people expected to have. Now Stanton and Anthony and that earlier generation didn't actually think women's suffrage was gonna lead to this particular legislation. They thought it was gonna lift women's self-esteem and make them more fully citizens of the United States. That's harder to measure, may well have done that. I mean, that's just harder to measure. But um, I think Stanton would have been quite shocked to learn that more than half white women in this country voted against what, what the presumed first woman president. I think she would have been quite shocked by that. So I guess I'll, um, I'll close with my final question, um, and then Elena, I'll give you a chance to ask Lori any final question that you might have. But Lori, I'm just interested um, if there's anything about Stanton that we you know, haven't mentioned, if you want to say, and um, you know, what your thoughts on what her legacy is today and um, how the suffragists, you know, after Stanton passed away, took that legacy through to the 19th Amendment and beyond. Well, it's a kind of good news, bad news thing. I mean, I really do believe that none of us would be willing to give up the rights that Elizabeth Cady Stanton demanded and that she viewed as individual rights that we should all have. I don't think, I think she was brilliant at establishing certain rights as inhering in the individual and being essential for women. At the same time, I think that the kind of um, assumption of belonging and entitlement and the racism in her thinking and writing have left a legacy for us and for feminism that's been very hard to address and eradicate. 
And I think that those are long-standing damaging things that aren't just you know, a sl slips of a tongue. I think they're, they run deeper than that, and I think that they um, are damaging to all of us. So we are currently in an anniversary year. This is why we are having these conversations right. around the 19th Amendment. So I'm curious, um, you pointed out earlier the differences between using the word celebrate and commemorate. Oh. Um, so how do you feel that we should commemorate this amendment? Oh, I was making the point that, right, that celebrating means we think that it's a happy ending and it's all a happy story. I mean, I don't think it's all such a happy story. Um, there's a wonderful philosopher named Sarah Ahmed who refers to herself and many of us as a feminist killjoy, always out to you know, ruin a good celebration. Um, but I think the commemoration is really important because it makes us think about our history. You know, we're living at a time when people are talking about statues and flags and the names on buildings and um, the names on universities. And all of these things are part of commemorating a history that we need to explore thoroughly and be complicated about. And I, I think there's wonderful exhibits in Washington, D.C. about um, the 19th Amendment that all take very different points of view, and not different points of view, but they look at different stuff and different interpretations. And I think it's great that we have this conversation of curators and museum folks and historians figuring out how all of this stuff is complicated, and then how do we, fortunately this is your job, put it in a visual way that's accessible to the most possible number of people. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you so much, Lori Ginsburg and Elena Popchak for being here.